Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast session on merger control in Asia, more scrutiny. I'm John Hicken and I'm joined today by Hannah Ha and together we co-head Mayor Brown's antitrust and competition team in Asia. By way of introduction and set the table, I'd like to ask the question, what is merger control? Essentially, we're talking about a procedure of reviewing mergers and acquisitions for competition law concerns. The purpose of merger control is to identify and prevent or remedy mergers that are likely to significantly harm competition. We can look at this at either the national level, for example, in any one of several Asian jurisdictions, or at a supranational level, for example, across the European Union. The point to note is that all major jurisdictions in Southeast Asia have some form of merger control. If you look at the map, you can see that countries that don't have merger control are highlighted in light grey, but in Asia that's limited to Cambodia and North Korea, the circled countries. Any significant deal, therefore, that touches Asia will almost invariably have merger control considerations. So turning to the agenda for today's webcast, I will first look at the Grab Uber case as a springboard for the discussion about merger control issues in Asia more generally. Hannah will then discuss questions that parties to a cross-border transaction should ask to preempt merger control issues. And I will then look, look at recent developments to merger control regimes in various Southeast Asian countries. So turning to the Grab Uber transaction. To begin with a little bit of information about the parties, so Grab is headquartered in Singapore and operates mobile platforms in the transportation, food and package delivery, mobile payments and financial services space in Southeast Asia. In the transportation space, Grab offers a ride hailing service. Uber, on the other hand, is a transportation network company headquartered in San Francisco, California, and Uber offers services including ride service hailing and food delivery. Now, in March 2018, Grab purchased Uber's Southeast Asian business that stretched across Singapore, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, Philippines and Vietnam. And the consideration for the deal was that Uber would take a 27.5% share in Grab. So turning to the, uh, uh, the analysis of this in various jurisdictions, firstly in Singapore. In March 2018, the Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore, CCCS, looked to investigate the transaction. And it found effectively that the transaction substantially lessened competition in the ride hailing platform market. It made the following observations. To begin with, the Grab increased prices after removal of its closest competitor. Also noting that the potential competitors were hampered by exclusivities and could not scale to compete effectively against Grab. There were strong networks effects which made it difficult for potential competitors to scale and expand in the market, particularly given that Grab had imposed exclusive obligations on taxi companies, car rental partners and some of its drivers. It was also considered Grab's exclusivities hampered the ability of potential competitors to access drivers and vehicles that were necessary for expansion in the market. As a consequence, the CCCS decided to fine the parties 13 million Singaporean dollars, approximately 9.4 million US dollars, uh, and that fine was imposed in September 2018. CCCS also issued various remedies to try and lessen the impact of the transaction on drivers and riders, such as maintaining Grab's pre-merger pricing algorithms and commission rates. Um, at the moment, that decision is under appeal by Uber. Turning to Vietnam, Vietnam's Com Competition and Consumer Authority, the VCCA, also announced in December 2018 that the transaction raised certain competition concerns. And it found that the transaction may have infringed a number of things, including, to begin with, Article 20 of the Law on Competition in Vietnam. This provision requires parties to an economic concentration to notify their transaction if the post-transaction market is between 30 and 50% of the relevant market. And in such circumstances, the parties may have infringed this article by failing to notify their transaction. They also referenced Article 18 of the Law on Competition, which pr prohibits economic concentrations that result in a post-transaction market share of over 50%. And again, it was noted the parties may have infringed this article by completing the transaction. <laughs> 
postscript to this is that the Vietnam Competition Council in June 2019 mentioned that the VCCA had argued Grab had 44.1% market share in Hanoi and 82.6% market share in Ho, Ho Chi Minh City post transaction. And the VCCA held that the transaction was not a share acquisition that led to Grab's control of Uber's equity interests, therefore not an economic concentration that is notifiable. The conclusion being that there is no violation of competition law in Vietnam. Turning to the Philippines, in April 2018, interim measures were imposed to maintain the status quo while the transaction was being reviewed. Subsequently, in May 2018, the Philippine Authority, the PCC, issued statement concerns. And then later in August 2018, the transaction was cleared with certain conditions imposed. In October 2018, the parties were fined at Philippine pesos 16 million, which is approximately 320,000 US dollars for violating the interim April 2018 measures. And finally, to complete the timeline, in January 2019, Grab was fined Philippine pesos 6.5 million, which is around 130,000 US dollars, for submitting deficient data as part of its voluntary commitments. So a number of key observations to note, having looked at the position across three different Southeast Asian jurisdictions. Firstly, cross-border transactions can certainly trigger competition law scrutiny in, in different jurisdictions, and also they can uh, result in different outcomes in those, each of those jurisdictions. And the other more general point to note is that the regulators are watching these types of deals currently in Southeast Asia. And whilst they're not necessarily following the decisions of each other, um, one needs to take care to make sure that the concerns in each of these jurisdictions can be addressed. Let's talk about the key questions to ask when we're doing a transaction. As illustrated by the Grab and Uber case, a transaction can trigger merger control filing issues in various jurisdictions. If merger control filing is required, it can affect the timing of a transaction. It can also affect the cost that the party would be required to pay. It, and sometimes it may even affect the structure of the transaction. So when we look at the, um, the key questions, the first one we need to ask is, is the transaction caught by merger control? The key element in this question is, is there a change of control? Not all transactions will be caught by merger control. For example, in the Grab and Uber case, the Singapore CCCS thought that the transaction was an asset purchase that resulted in a change of control. While in Vietnam, the VCC thought that the transaction was not a share acquisition that led to Grab's control of Uber's equity interest. We also have to pay attention to certain acquisition of minority shareholdings, because sometimes acquisition of minority shareholdings can also trigger merger control. For example, if the minority shareholder has veto rights over key business decisions, it can be deemed as having control over the target entity. So if there is a merger, if there is a change of control in a transaction, the next question that we need to look at is what are the countries of concern? Which countries do the parties generate significant revenue, whether they have significant assets and whether they have significant market share or share of supply? For example, in Singapore, the regulators will look at the market share to determine whether a filing is required. The next question will then be, is notification required in the country? And whether the regime is a voluntary one, like the Singapore one? So you, don't, you have to do your own assessment and decide whether you do the filing or not. Or is it a mandatory one, like the Vietnam and the China regime? So long as there is a change of control and the turnover thresholds are met, then filing is required. We also have to look at whether there is any suspensory obligation prior to approval or the filing can be done post-merger. For example, in Indonesia, the obligation is to notify the transaction post-merger and no requirement to suspend closing pending clearance. If notification is required in the relevant countries, then the next question would be 
Does the transaction raise competition concerns? Speaking of competition concerns, we have to look at the transaction, whether it is a horizontal one, a vertical, or a conglomerate one. If it is a horizontal one, it tends to raise more competition concerns as there would be a removal of a competitor from the market after the merger. If it is a vertical or conglomerate one, it tends to be more pro-competitive, although competition concerns have arisen in such cases too before. We also have to look at the market, condition, market definition, which is the key to this question. The larger the market is defined, the less likely the transaction will raise competition concerns. For example, in Singapore, the relevant market was defined narrowly. It is defined as booked, chauffeured, point-to-point -point transport services in Singapore, excluding street-held taxis. While in Vietnam, the relevant market defined in the Grab and Uber case was very broad. The VCCA conceded during the hearing before the VCA that taxi were part of the relevant market with ride-hailing apps. We also need to look at other factors apart from the market definition when we talk about competition concerns. We need to see whether the barriers to entry is high or low, whether the barriers are so high or so many that the new players will be difficult to get into the market, whether the countervailing power of the buyer is so substantial that will eliminate or offset some of the market power of the service provider, and whether the merger will create efficiencies which will outweigh the competition concerns raised by the merger. So if there are competition concerns, we need to think at the outset about whether remedies would need to be offered or we need to change the transaction structure so as to alleviate the concerns of the regulators. In this concluding segment, I'd like to look at some developing trends in competition law across Southeast Asian countries. In Southeast Asia, as mentioned, competition law is relatively new and it's a very dynamic area where we're seeing uh, the landscape change quickly. So it's important to pay attention to legislative changes, regulatory uh, changes and, and emerging trends. So to do that, we'd like to look at a few examples in jurisdictions across Southeast Asia. Starting with Thailand. In 2017, the Trade Competition Act in Thailand was introduced and it contained merge control provisions. But in December 2018, implementing regulations were published, which finally specified the notification thresholds uh, and the implementation for merge control rules, distinguishing notably between those deals which, firstly, required pre-closing approval, these being any merger or acquisition, a consolidation, which may result in a monopoly or create dominance, but which must obtain approval from the Commission before the transaction can be completed. As distinct from post-closing notification, which applies to any consolidation which may materially reduce competition in any relevant market, in which circumstances it would have to be notified to the Commission within seven days from the date of completion of the transaction. So the merge control rules of last December provide that a transaction would be deemed materially to reduce competition if one, the turnover of at least one business operator or of the consolidating parties in aggregate in any given market was at least a billion Thai baht, and two, if the consolidation does not result in a monopoly or dominance position. Similarly, we see developments in the Vietnam market. We've already mentioned Vietnam, but to mention a few uh, legislative changes that are coming or have come in Vietnam recently. So as from 1st July 2019, we see more stringent merger control rules in Vietnam. Previously under the 2004 law on competition in Vietnam, notification was based on market shares. For example, post-economic concentration market share between 30 to 50 percent. Whereas under the 2018 law on competition, which has recently come into effect, new notification thresholds based on value of parties' assets, turnover, or value of transaction have been introduced. And by reason of this, we expect that more transactions will be caught by the relatively low notification thresholds. For example, 
either party's turnover in Vietnam crosses 43 million US dollars, or if the value of the transaction exceeds 21.5 million US dollars. Indonesia is another example of where we've seen uh, the possibility, the prospect of change. So there have been proposals made in Indonesia recently to amend the merge control rules and they're currently being considered by the Indonesian parliament. And draft legislation includes the introduction of a mandatory pre-closing and suspensory notification requirement and with a proposed waiting period of 21 working days for the KPPU, the Inter Indonesian Competition Regulator, to assess transactions and increase notification thresholds. This has received the backing from the House of Representatives in September 2018 and we expect to see some developments in Indonesia in the near future. Finally, Malaysia. Uh, the regulator has reportedly been in the process of pushing the introduction of general merge control regime rules in Malaysia and that's another area to pay attention to. So I think the broad message from this webcast is that competition law regulated in Southeast Asia are becoming increasingly robust. They're implementing stricter rules across their jurisdictions and it's important for businesses with potential deals in the region to be aware of the competition law risk in this area. We hope you found this webcast of interest. Uh, thank you very much for listening to us today and please don't hesitate to contact Hannah or myself if you have any questions and you can find our contact details in the materials that accompany this webcast. Thank you very much.